Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Backer and welcome to Write Better Stories. Today I am recording outside because, like I said, I don't have any cell phone service or internet at my house and I was going to do it in my car again, but it was uh, raining earlier, but now it's nice and uh, this is a pretty good street too, so I'll kind of show you guys some of that business. But today I'm going to be making a video about Nightwood once again. This is a uh, book that I've made one video about in the past, and I'm actually planning on doing more videos about this. I was originally planning on doing one big comprehensive video, but this book is way too dense to reduce to something like that. So I'm just going to be picking out some of my favorite passages and doing my best to offer that comprehensive view among several videos. So the one that I'm going to be talking about today is uh, maybe a little bit surprising because it's actually about two men. And this entire book is supposed to be a romance about two women. And so it's actually curious, too, that Juna Barnes decided to make the first section called Bow Down um, mostly about this character named Felix. And I think that um, this is actually an interesting choice because I think it zeroes in on the concept of marginalized identities by literally focusing on a man at the forefront of this story and then literally marginalizing within the narrative the characters who are shown to be marginalized identities. Um, I hope that makes sense. So this character, Felix, I think is really funny because he is somebody that has this kind of silly respect for the past and he calls himself the Baron. And in my last video, I talked about his father. I don't know how I'm getting out of breath not even walking that fast, but he basically talks about his father who had this uh, great respect for the past and kind of stylized himself as a baron and even created this, oh, painting of who his parents were supposed to be that were these noble figures, but they were actually just actors that were hired to be a uh, part of this painting. And so then his son, Felix, like I said, calls himself the Baron, actually does not have any noble past or anything like that, but since the first section is called Bowed Down, it really shows, I think, both like a submission to this idea of a noble past, but then also a respect for the noble past. And then as the narrative continues, you get people that end up having constructed identities like the Duchess and the Princess in this group of circus performers that he falls in line with and there's even a section in the book where one of these circus performers takes him to the house of this guy who is supposed to be a count and Felix asks if he's actually a count and his friend responds I mean are any of us really what we say that we are are you really a baron is this person really a duchess and specifically for all of the characters that she mentions the answer is no these are just names that they actually put on in order uh, to kind of accelerate the identities that they have within their circus performances. But it also calls attention to Felix's own constructed identity as a baron, that he basically feels safe within this idea of stylizing himself as a baron. But then when he meets people who deviate from the sort of approved upon identities of the time, he is filled with this giddy joy and this, um, oh, kind of this... Uh, Maybe this like sneaky sense that he's like getting away uh, with something because um, the idea of like worshiping the past and constructing yourself as a baron and uh, kneeling down to nobility and that sort of thing, it's, uh, it's exceptionally safe. And I actually think that this is, um, as a character and as a book, it's, it's very timely because there's a lot of people that have a lot of respect for this idea of the West and that uh, it's apparently crumbling and that's a lot of the rhetoric that is being used um, against like immigration and then also on the alt-right people are always talking about how the West is this noble thing that needs to be preserved and the uh, the whole concept of conservatism is actually couched in this idea that the West is important and it would be a greater loss to move on to something else than it would be to preserve what we have developed within the West and so maybe I'm um, bringing too much of my own interpretation into what I'm going to be talking about, so I'll shut up on that for now. But if you haven't checked out this book, I highly recommend it. Um, I'm going to do a reading from one of the more complicated sections, in my opinion, where 
Um, th this is after Felix meets a man named the Doctor, who, if I understand correctly, is not like a licensed doctor, but he is a, a cross-dressing abortionist. And uh, that alone should tell you that there's a little bit of um, constructed identity going on. Specifically in the 1930s, too, this would have been a lot more radical. And basically what the section that I'm going to read describes is the fact that Oh, um, Felix is, um, I think you could argue maybe smitten a little bit romantically. I'm not convinced that's exactly what it is, but I think, um, the romance that he might feel for the doctor, notwithstanding, he definitely feels excited by the fact that, um, this doctor is a little bit outside of the norm and maybe offers a path forward for Felix. And, uh, yeah, so then it, obviously in future videos, I'm going to get into, the actual romance that's at the heart of Nightwood. But um, again, the fact that this story begins with this interaction between these men and this focus on Felix as a character, I think really highlights the fact that the book will be investigating marginalized identities. So that was an enormously long preamble, but let me get into this section. You won't be able to see it, but I'm holding the book. Oh shit, one sec. Okay. Whew. It's a lot harder doing this outside. Okay. So in my edition, this is on page 34, and I'm going to do my best to read it without stuttering. Hope I didn't jinx myself. As the altar of a church would present but a barren stylization for the uncalculated offerings of the confused and humble, as the corsage of a woman is made suddenly martial and sorrowful by the rose thrust among the more decorous blooms by the hand of a lover, suffering the violence of the overlapping of the permission to bestow a last embrace and its withdrawal, making a vanishing and infinitesimal bullseye of that which had a moment before been a buoyant and showy bosom by dragging time out of his bowels, for a lover knows two times that which he has given and that which he must make. So Felix was astonished to find the most touching flowers laid on the altar he had raised to his imagination were placed there by the people of the underworld, and that the reddest was to be the rose of the doctor." So this is a section that I literally had to read like 10 times when I first um, went through it because it wasn't that like I didn't understand how to interpret it, is that it's like I literally didn't know what Juna Barnes was, was getting at. Just on a denotative level, it evaded me because it is a long uh, run-on sentence that has a lot of clauses and colons and uh, parentheses. And uh, I think that just to like extremely dumb it down. I'm going to like translate into um, dumb guy's English what Juno Barnes is getting at with this really beautiful prose here. So um, the first section here, as the altar of a church would present but a barren stylization for the uncalculated offerings of the confused and humble. I think that um, this definitely connotes the idea of reverent awe and the fact that she uses the word uncalculated means that this isn't necessarily something that would come easy or knowably to Felix, that um, he is sort of paying this deferential respect to the doctor who is this, uh, you know, like I said, a cross-dressing abortionist, somebody that definitely exists on the margin and outside of the traditional notions of masculinity. And Felix doesn't approach this with any kind of knowledge or certainty as to what the doctor is, but almost a reverent awe of something that exceeds his traditional notions for understanding other people. So that would be to zero in on the idea that it is uncalculated, but then also this idea of reverence, that it's an altar that uh, he makes of his respect for the doctor. And then also we get this idea of his uh, reverence for the doctor being this corsage or being compared to the corsage of a woman. So as the corsage of a woman is made suddenly martial, and sorrowful by the rose thrust among the more decorous blooms by the hand of a lover suffering the violence of the overlapping of the permission to bestow a last embrace and its withdrawal. So I think this zeroes in on a theme that becomes investigated in much greater detail in this section called the La Somnambule, which I believe means the uh, sleepwalker. And uh, his relationship with this character named Robin Vogt is very characterized by this idea that she is very distant and sleepy. And in fact, when he first meets her, it's because she has fainted. And then the doctor who he's hanging out with is called up to her room to basically see if she's okay. 
And then uh, his relationship with Robin Vogt ends up being characterized by the idea that um, she's not really into him. She's very distant. She's going on all of these uh, mysterious walks into the night. And uh, I'll definitely get into that more because um, if she's going into the night in a book called Nightwood, you know it's significant. And so I think that it's possible that, like I said, Juna Barnes is trying to say that he is developing kind of like a crush on the doctor. Um, I'm not necessarily convinced that that's what it is, but I think it's definitely possible because it is this idea of him being uh, attracted to the doctor because he is so um, outside of the norm of what Felix would be used to. But the idea that he's comparing his interest, I'm sorry, that Juna Barnes is comparing Felix's interest in the doctor to a corsage gets at this idea of Felix's attraction to things that have a double-edged sword to them, that it's basically attractive to him, but then also somehow impossible for him to grasp because he is so stuck within fashioning himself within this traditional notion of masculinity and nobility. So um, like it says, it's the corsage of a woman that's made suddenly martial and sorrowful by the rose thrust among the more decorous blooms by the hand of a lover suffering the violence of the overlapping of the permission to bestow a last embrace and its withdrawal that he, he gets this, um, this invitation as if it's a beautiful rose, but then after getting permission to give a hug and then pulling away, it gets that idea that he can't ever really own anyone or know them or be with them to the capacity that he would like to, that um, anything that he is attracted to is in some way transient and unavailable to him as well. Um, and so I think that that's underscored by the idea of making a vanishing and infinitesimal bullseye of that which had a moment before been a, bo a buoyant and showy bosom by dragging time out of his bowels. Um, I think that, yeah, that underscores that same idea that um, the bullseye obviously is something that is a target, something that he is attracted to, but then it's vanishing and fleeting in some way, that anything that he is attracted to isn't going to be um, totally able uh, for him to grasp. And then the part about the time, by dragging time out of his bowels for a lover knows two times that which he has given and that which he must make. I think that this gets into that same idea of the fleeting aspects of that which he is attracted to, that it's, uh, he has to drag time out of his bowels, basically like in order to make the things that he desires more attainable, he has to uh, almost commit at like an abstract violence to himself and give himself more time, the time that he uh, is given freely by the people that he is attracted to, but then also um, he, in, in that yearning for that, uh, oh, wanting to like own or possess the people that he is attracted to, he has to kind of um, deny himself in a certain way. And that would be the time that he must make in my interpretation anyway. And then it says, lastly, so Felix was astonished to find that the most touching flowers laid on the altar he had raised to his imagination were placed there by the people of the underworld and that the reddest was to be the rose of the doctors. So um, that one I think is pretty straightforward, but I'll go ahead and interpret it as well that Felix is astonished. So he's, he's surprised to find out that the thing that he is attracted to more than anything from this uh, group of circus performers that he falls into is not the beautiful women, but this cross-dressing abortionist doctor, um, who is a man, by the way, I don't know if I, if I mentioned that. And uh, I think that um, a lot of this book can be enlightened by a lot of the ideas put forth by Thaddeus Russell, who is a historian and a podcaster that I really like. Um, one of his like main points that he talks about is the idea that history and culture and freedom are pushed forward by people that are actually considered bad in society, not necessarily just marginalized identities, but people that um, basically do what society says is wrong. So it doesn't sound very radical, but it actually is in the way that he talks about it because, um, oh, like one of the examples he, he gives is like the difference between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. And he's obviously a fan of both, but he is saying that Martin Luther King had a more um, familiar appeal to like the traditional conservatives because he presented himself as somebody that was willing to um, integrate into society and um, yeah, integrate within the norms of society. Whereas Michael, uh, Michael X, <laughs> Malcolm X was somebody that was much more explicitly against the norms of society. And I think in general, this is something that what um, that uh, Felix as a character is waking up to in this section and his attraction to the doctor, whether it's romantic or otherwise, is that 
Felix is somebody that just tried to be everything that you think that you should be in this society, that uh, he worships nobility and aristocracy and calls himself the Baron, but then he finds himself hanging out with all of these circus performers and these people that knowingly construct their identities um, in a way that isn't very traditional, and he's realizing that this is so much more exciting and liberating and attractive and uncalculated, too. That would be probably the most interesting part of all of this, is that um, there's also a really good section when he first meets the doctor that the doctor, I think, says something along the lines of, like, uh, oh, that, like, the, the time is, like, dragging by. And he, he's, he, the doctor basically just makes an aside that says that uh, the people around him are being impatient. And then this is considered, like, so radical to Felix that he literally starts laughing and apologizing because he's, he's um, exploding with all of this emotion that he's always repressed in his life. And uh, just by having somebody like the doctor who has not as much of a care for propriety like Felix does, it releases all of this emotion within Felix and he has to apologize for it as if laughing is this um, disgusting and noble thing. And since this video is getting kind of long, I'm going to go ahead and end it there. There is so much more to talk about in this book, so you can expect some more videos. And uh, thank you for bearing with me in this uh, very beautiful environment and for listening to me uh, get out of breath just walking up a modest hill. But yeah, I hope this helps you write better stories. And if you haven't read this book, do yourself a favor. It's absolutely fantastic. Goodbye.